It's the first winter here at my new wildlife homestead, and so far it's been cold, quiet, and incredibly peaceful. About a month ago, I started exploring the property and trying to figure out which species spend their winter here. I set up trail cameras to track some of the larger animals and put up some feeders to observe the birds, including a feeding station in the forest where there had likely never been one before, just to see if there's any difference between the feeders at the house and the feeders in the middle of the forest. This past month had more twists and turns than I expected and didn't go at all how I had planned, but here's what happened. The first thing I wanted to do was to get all the trail cameras out as quickly as possible. These will work 24 seven to monitor the wildlife moving through the property. And there weren't a whole lot of tracks or game trails to go off of. So I placed them along the main and side trails and little areas of interest like the pond in the forest. I even set up a cellular trail camera that would send photos and videos directly to my phone. With all the cameras in place at this point, it was just a waiting game until we got our first species on the cameras. While I waited, I wanted to move on to setting up the bird feeders for the first time. Around the house was easy. I set up a few seed feeders, suet cages, a heated bird bath, and a small window feeder so Sparrow could also enjoy some bird watching. I then scouted a location for the forest feeders. I wanted somewhere tucked away in the forest, but not so hidden that the wildlife would have trouble finding it. I eventually stumbled on this little open patch and I thought it would be a nice setup since the birds would be able to see the feeders from above and there was also some good cover for them to hide in close by. We had some strong windstorms over the past week and there were a few conifers that had fallen and blocked our path, so I cut the tops off to use as perches so birds would have somewhere to land before going to the feeders. I then took all of the extra branches from the trees I cut to make a small brush pile and I cut a maple that had fallen into sections to use as woodpecker feeding posts. The maple had some sapsucker holes, which gave me the idea to make some larger ones to hold peanuts and homemade suet. I put up the rest of the feeders, but didn't fill them up until the next day since we were getting some snow overnight. Food-wise, I went with a little of everything. Since I'm not sure which birds are around, I wanted to cast a wide net so there'd be something for everyone. I also added a platform feeder of grit, which is just sand and some small rocks. Birds swallow small rocks to help grind the food in their gizzards, and since most of the rocks are covered by a few feet of snow in the winter, this could be a valuable resource. I also made a few trails leading to the feeding station to hopefully increase the odds of something finding it and triggering the trail camera. Here's the feeding station so far. You can see the three trails I made leading right into the middle, and I also set up a hide at the bottom. I'm hoping to build out more permanent feeding stations in the spring when I can actually dig, but for now, it's not a bad start. Like the trail cameras, it's now just a waiting game. It could take days or even weeks for birds to find new feeders. And since we're about 500 meters away from the house, I wasn't sure how long it would take. But in my mind, this is how I thought everything would go down. In the first few days, chickadees would arrive. They're usually the first ones to find a new feeder. And as they gathered, their vocalizations would echo throughout the forest, bringing in the next round of birds like woodpeckers and nuthatches. And eventually, all of that activity would attract my two target species, evening grosbeaks and pine grosbeaks. They're one of the main reasons I'm setting up these winter feeders because I've been trying for five years to get these two species at my feeders, and each year I've come up empty-handed. This feeding station is right down the trail from where I saw Pine Grow Speak my first few days here. So I'm hoping at this new property, this will be the year I'll finally get them. The next morning, I woke up to a notification that my cell trail camera sent me over 200 videos. And I'm so excited to share, we got some incredible footage of snow. Yep, snow falling, snow accumulating, just some wonderful insight into the secret world of snow. Please stay tuned for the documentary. But luckily, after all of these false triggers, we did officially have our first species on another camera. Funny enough, it was the camera at the feeding station, and it wasn't even a bird, but a snowshoe hare. You can see its eye glowing on the left. We've had a bunch of their tracks around, but since they're nocturnal, I haven't really had any chances to spot them. So in the morning, I followed the tracks and the scat and eventually found it resting under a small cluster of conifers. During the first week, this was the only animal to show up on any of the trail cameras, and it was also the only animal to show up around these feeders. Not a single seed had been eaten. There wasn't even red squirrel or mouse tracks around. The feeders at the front, however, were starting to pick up. It didn't take long since the previous owners left one behind, so we already had a few species familiar with the area. 
But the feeders were buzzing with black-capped chickadees, red-breasted nuthatches, Canada jays, hairy woodpeckers, and red squirrels. Overall, week one was a little more quiet than I expected, and surprisingly, week two had even less activity. No new species at the feeders up front, and nothing had visited the feeders in the forest either. The trail cameras were also empty. There were plenty of tracks around though, tracks of foxes, coyotes, grouse, and hares. But all the tracks were random and they weren't really using any path consistently. We have had some warmer days that formed a crust on top of the snow, so my guess is they can still travel wherever they want without having to waste energy trucking through the deep snow. But once we did get our first big snowfall, I went out with my snowshoes to make trails that went right beside most of the cameras. And a couple of days later, the work paid off because we got our first red fox on the cameras. This was definitely a nice pick-me-up after a mostly slow week. At the beginning of week three, we started getting more activity by the house. We doubled our chickadee population to about 12, and we also got two new species at the feeders, common and hoary red poles. These beautiful little birds are some of my favorite winter visitors. They add a nice pop of color to a mostly green and white landscape, and they'll soon be returning to their breeding grounds in the far north. But besides the new species, this was the week where I kind of accepted the fact that things were progressing a lot slower than I anticipated. So I spent most of the week exploring the property, I identified and measured trees, I searched for potential nesting cavities, and most of my time went towards planning a bigger wildlife habitat project for the spring. That is one benefit to moving here in the winter is we have a few months to plan projects before the busiest time of the year. Towards the end of week three, I woke up one morning to find a male pine grosbeak sitting in the apple tree in the yard. I thought, this was it, this is the moment I'll finally get one at the feeders, and then it just left, and it didn't come back, and that's when I realized the feeder was completely emptied by the red squirrels the day before. It's always difficult getting new species to use a feeder for the first time, and I just missed probably my best chance to do that. But little did I know at the time that the squirrels emptying the feeders would set off a small chain of events that would eventually bring the first bird to the forest feeders. When I went out to fill the empty feeders, because there wasn't any seed left, I noticed the chickadees were landing a lot closer to me than usual. I haven't hand fed the chickadees here and I'm not sure if the previous owners did, but they kept trying to land on me so I decided to give it a shot. It took about 20 minutes before the first one landed and once the others realized it was safe, they started grabbing some seeds as well. From here on out, I'd have a small group of chickadees coming and check if I had any seed from time to time. And a couple days after this, I was walking along the main trail and saw some moose tracks coming out of the forest. It walked onto the trail, followed my footpath and stood right next to one of the trail cameras. So I stopped to check the trail camera and sure enough, we had a few videos of the first moose this winter. I originally had the camera set to take one photo and then a video, but the time between them is longer than I expected and I think it's causing us to miss some shots, so I now switched all the trail cameras to video mode only. But while I was watching this footage, I noticed some of the chickadees were landing nearby, and after the past few days I always made sure to keep a pocket full of seeds in case they came around, and I noticed I was only about 50 meters away from the forest feeders, so I took out the seed and slowly walked over there, and before I knew it there was a small group of them calling from the trees above, and after a little bit of time, the first one finally landed on the feeders. What I thought would take a few days to happen took almost four weeks. This was the first step to hopefully getting evening and pine gross speaks at this feeding station. But considering how long it took to get the first chickadee, I figured it may also be a while until the new birds show up. So I decided I'd wait one week before coming to spend a couple of days in the hide to see which new species were using the feeding station. Finally, the time had come, I put fresh seed out, sat in my hide for two days, and I was shocked by all of the activity at the feeders. Some of the species that showed up included black-capped chickadees, black-capped chickadees, black-capped chickadees, and of course, black-capped chickadees. Yeah, um, <laughs> nothing else showed up. My plan of getting them here to eventually attract more species has failed so far. I thought that for the time being that this is where the story ends, but that's when something unexpected happened. I was editing this video when out of my window I saw a flash of red fly into the pines. I thought it may have been a cardinal, but when I looked a little closer, it was a beautiful male pine grosbeak. I was waiting for it to make its way down to the feeder, but that's when I realized there was already a small group of them feeding under the apple tree. Finally, after years of trying and a month of effort at the new property, I was watching pine grosbeaks at my feeders. Not only did they show up on this day, but they've been visiting every day for the past week, so I've been able to share many beautiful winter days with them.
Even though we didn't get evening gross beaks, I'm still trying, and I'm also working on some other similar projects to try to attract new birds to the property. When you only see a handful of species a day, adding just one new species to the property can make these long and quiet winters a little more exciting, and I can't wait to see what we can attract next. Mm -hmm.